Hi everyone, welcome. It's good to see some recurring faces in the call and some new ones. Um, this is the DFA Spark series. I see some people filtering in. Um, if you have a chance, we'd love to see your faces if you can sort of share your video. If not, totally great. My name's Alden Burke. I am the program coordinator for Design for America. And the DFA Spark series is a weekly webinar that we have every Wednesday at 1 p.m. bringing inspiration uh, into your living room, a moment for us to sort of gather virtually and have conversation. Uh, this week, I'm really, really excited to um, be hosting the call with Eric Roddenbeck and Ka Cassidy Curtis. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, um, they're talking going to be about mapping change, designing a visual archive. We're really going to be talking about the art form of graffiti today, which I'm really excited about because graffiti is a form that is so nuanced and complicated and beautiful, right? It's art, it's activism, it is both ideas and voice, it's community, it's a subversion, but it's also zoning, it's commodification, it's gentrification, it's ephemerality and it's monument and it's also time and space. Um, so we're really gonna start to dig into all, how graffiti can be all of these things at once and how we might think about graffiti as a way, the sort of rise of graffiti during this moment, during quarantine, during the pandemic, to really think about the ways that we are seeing and expressing um, and the forms in which we're doing that. So with that, uh, I will remind everyone, this uh, recording, this Zoom call is being recorded. Um, it will be put up on our blog for you all to reference later, for other folks in the DFA Plus network to listen to. Um, and then otherwise, as Eric and Cassidy are presenting, Please feel free to use the chat to ask questions, to share resources. Um, they're gonna present and then we'll have a conversation and I'll use that, um, your questions and feedback as a way to sort of facilitate that conversation. So don't be shy. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to you, Eric. Okay, awesome. I, I'm uh, sorry to be behind this, having some work done around the house. So, um, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Not unclear, okay. yeah. Cool. Um, so welcome. I'm, uh, I'm Eric Rodenbeck. I'm the founder of Stamen Design in San Francisco. We, we used to be in San Francisco, I guess. I'm not sure where we are anymore. Um, uh, but we are um, a data visualization and mapping firm. Um, and um, we mostly do work with mapping different kinds of data, um, sometimes over time, sometimes in space. Um, I'm delighted to have invited my um, very old dear friend, Cassidy Curtis, um, onto the call. Um, he came to me, uh, gosh, 2007, so 13 years ago, with um, a project that he had in mind. Um, he had been going around taking photographs of graffiti um, in San Francisco and, and, and other places, and he decided that he was going to want a, an interface that was going to let people explore those uh, graffiti walls um, over time. He sort of had a long-standing interest in, in type and, and time and other things. So um, the project that we're going to first start talking about today is, um, is Cassidy's brainchild. It's called Graffiti Archaeology. Um, and Cassidy, maybe you want to say a couple things about it? Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, it's even older than that. Like I started taking pictures in the, in the late 90s. Um, and uh, I think Eric and I started working on this together in around between 2000, 2002. And, uh, um, you know, we built the interface in, in Flash, which was uh, a hot new thing at the time. And, uh, but it, it really came out of the, the genesis of the project was just that I used to take the bus to work every day and I would pass by these places that were covered with graffiti and, um, you know, started noticing that the graffiti was changing and just was curious about, the, about that. And as a total uh, outsider to that world, I don't, I don't write. I don't paint um, on walls, but uh, um, you know, growing up in in New York with Eric, uh, we went to high school together. Um, um, you know, it was part of the environment uh, that that we were immersed in all the time, and um, came to realize that I, I really valued the 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 impact that graffiti had on my life, and I wanted to learn more about the culture and learn more about why why things changed the way that they did. And so I just took my camera and just went out and started shooting pictures of every wall that I, that I could, just because I was, I, was, I was into the letter forms and everything. Um, and it was after a couple of years of that that I started realizing that I actually had photos of the same location. I had gone back to the same location multiple times and shot different work uh, that was on the walls. And 
took all of my photos and spread them out on my bed and started trying to layer them up on top of each other to see what matched with what. And that led to doing that in Photoshop and doing perspective, keystone correction, et cetera, et cetera. And that led to graffiti archaeology as a project. And so Eric and I built this uh, interface um, um, together that, that lets you go through it in, in, in time lapse and see how the wall has changed over time. Um, so I, I don't know if that's enough of an intro. Uh, what do you think, uh, Oliver? Should we go straight to the, should we go show the work? Yeah, we, let's see it. Show, show don't tell. Yeah. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. There we go. Okay. Um, cool. So this is graffiti archaeology. Um, and what we've got here um, is an interface that lets you explore. Uh, on the left side, there are some different walls that Cassidy went to. Um, across the middle are, uh, across the bottom here are individual times that Cassidy went back to the, um, to the site. And then there's the graffiti in the middle. You can also um, zoom in to this and kind of pan around and, and see what's going on. So that's, that's kind of the fun, that's a fun part of it. The part that I'm most enamored of is just the ability to go backwards and forwards in time. So here we're in 2007 and I'll just, I'll just step through this wall, which is one of the, one of the nicer ones. Um, and you start to just get a sense that these walls are not, well, they're certainly not static, right? I mean, they're, 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 dynamic, they change over time. Um, different parts of them change at different rates to one another. So, you know, between these two walls almost entirely, where sometimes you just see a little bit of a change. Um, I love thinking about these, there's this, there's this um, medieval word for um, the page of, a, uh, of, a, of, an, of an illuminated manuscript, it's called a pal palimpsest. And it's basically a page that's been written on and painted on uh, and then erased and then written on and painted on again and written on and pasted on again. So what you get in, by looking at these is just an appreciation of just how um, ephemeral this world is and how dedicated people are. I mean, these, these kind of just enormous, um, enormous changes taking place. Just this idea of a, of a, of a, of a wall as, um, we, don't, we don't usually think of architecture as occupying like a moment in time. It all seems so, um, like it's sort of always been this way. And we were talking earlier on the on the call. Um, Cassidy was saying that this area, for a long time, I mean, you can see this is like this is years and years and years that people have been working on this wall. Sometimes working on it and then leaving, um, and then coming back. But there's this. So the, uh, we don't think that that people are using the wall anymore because the developers made the area nicer. Kind of decided that um, graffiti was incompatible with their property values. So that's the interface and it's kind of, um, it, it's, there's a, there's a lot here and a lot of what I like to do is just kind of zip through it really fast and get a real sense of that, that dynamic nature of the work. Um, there's some fun stuff starts to happen and I, it's, I'm sort of a, just a giant fan of just taking the same photograph over and over again and seeing what changes because um, it can lead you down some really interesting avenues and, and this one in particular I'm, I'm really fond of. Um, Cassidy, you want to talk about this one? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is a place that uh, I got to visit in um, in LA um, on you know a trip that I was I was down there for other reasons and um, you know whenever I'm in a new city I always try to um, you know spend some time in the nasty little smelly corners of it where where people are likely to paint and uh, um, some friends um, you know told me about this spot um, and uh, what was really interesting was. Uh, you know, it's this tunnel entry, and 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 uh, it was all it was all fenced off and boarded up. Um, and I got really curious about what the what the backstory was behind this tunnel. And it turns out that it's actually um, uh, like a lot of places in Los Angeles, it's been used as a film set for all kinds of things. There was a TV show called V that was on in the '80s that uh, had some scenes that were shot there. There were a bunch of movies oh that were shot there. I think Night of the Living Dead might have had some scenes uh, shot there. Um, and I think this is actually a scene from, uh, from one of these TV shows. I think this is like the, the resistance against the uh, alien lizard people. Um, this is where the resistance has its uh, headquarters. Um, so, you know, a lot of good, you know, I think anytime you need to have something that's um, countercultural, uh, uh, you know, you shoot it in a place like this. Um, but if you go back even further, um, you know, you get to find out what the tunnel was actually used for when it was still functioning as a tunnel. 
And um, um, uh, this guy, uh, Jim Stubshire, was uh, a photographer who was obsessed with trolleys and trains. And um, I found this photo on his website and um, actually got into a whole conversation with him about the history of the, uh, the, the tram lines that used to be in LA and are no more. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, I just love this. I love, I love that about places that um, places have this extension through time and that, you know, the palimpsest includes not just what's painted on the walls, but what the walls were actually there for in the first place. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just great to have an excuse to dig back uh, through this. And that, and it brings up one other, you know, important point about graffiti archaeology is that it isn't based exclusively on my own photos. Um, this is kind of the first really big collaborative web, uh, web art project that, um, that I got to engage in where um, through websites like Art Crimes and other graffiti archives and also through Flickr as it was starting to come up, um, I got to really extend out and find these communities of people who were as interested in graffiti as I was and um, learn a ton from them um, and, uh, um, you, know, t you know, go out and take, you know, uh, go out on shooting expeditions with people that I met um, on Flickr. Um, um, two of those people actually, actually met at one of those uh, meetups and are, are, are married now um, as a result. So um, really kind of like, like sort of like a wonderful moment in internet history as well, because this was coming up during the time when the internet had not been so thoroughly commercialized yet. And it was still a place where like regular people um, could meet up and do amazing things. And, um, you know, I know Eric is really keeping that alive with the work that he's doing at Stamen. And um, um, I think it's really important that we all keep that spirit alive on the internet because we need it more than ever. Cool. So I thought I'd show this wall also, and I'm happy to, to show other walls and do other things. Oh, great, it's a demo, so it doesn't work. Perfect. Ah. Oh, hit, hit zero, it'll come back. All right. <laughs> Um, so this wall I really like a lot um, because it, it gets painted over and over and over. Um, and um, Cassidy might have some, some things to say about who's actually doing that, that painting. But I'll just take you through this one because this wall is just nuts. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the difference between those two is kind of cool. And then we go back in time and there's just all this amazing stuff going on. So that's, you know, so Jash, J Jast, I guess, was there start you can find out when like when it, when it first came out um but you can see in the back there's kind of these gray stripes um and the reason that there are those gray stripes is because every once in a while the wall just gets totally painted over um and so just the, the and it's, it's kind of an amazing thing like how quickly it goes from like being painted over to like just the whole wall is covered again like that this 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 little transition is a nice one but again this idea that um you've got um, this group of people that are coming and doing this art that's ephemeral, um, but in its own way, kind of long lasting. I mean, we're looking now, this is a period of a whole, we just went back about a year. Um, and this idea that at any moment, the whole thing could go away, gives it a kind of, yeah, look at that, it's, it did it again. And then this, <laughs> I love this, just took over the whole, took over the whole wall. I don't know, you know who that is, Cassidy? Uh, uh, oh, who is that? That's, uh, uh... I'm just curious. You would know. Oh, it's a, uh, I think it's a, 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 a attic. Attic. You just Maybe. came in and just took the whole took the whole wall back. It's amazing. Yeah, and this is and this is definitely this is definitely a battle, um, you know, going on between there's some beef between attic and uh, somebody else, and this is a this is a case where um, you know someone someone slighted somebody else in some way. Um, and this kind of gets to, you know, you know, a lot of the, the, um, the cultural um, structure of the graffiti world, that there, there are rules to this world, um, you know, and uh, uh, they come, you know, down through generations of writers who kind of mentored with their, their elders over the years since the 60s. And, you know, one of the rules that you just don't violate is um, you never paint over something um, with something less uh, artistic, you know, or less, uh, less, you know, less time consuming and, and, and less beautiful. Um, and uh, if you, if you do something like that, it's, 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 it's disrespectful. Um, and uh, 
where these kind of beefs and battles come from is that sometimes there's some dispute about which piece actually deserves to go over um, um, someone else's piece. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a, there's a whole, you know, you, you, and you'll see these, these battles actually play out across the entire city sometimes. Um, and the other piece that's kind of interesting about seeing this kind of periodic whitewashing of the walls is that, um, you know, you would, you would think naively that um, whitewashing the wall would somehow thwart the kind of urban blight effect of, you know, ugly graffiti. Um, but it has a completely counter, counterintuitive effect, which is that if you take a wall where um, people paint on a regular basis and you never whitewash it, what happens because of that cultural ethos of the, of the graffiti writers is the work will continue to get better and better because nobody wants to paint over something with something that looks worse. And so as people spend more time there and learn that there's no threat of your work getting painted over uh, by whitewashing crews, um, people are willing to invest more time in their work. And that's when you start to see these productions that take an entire weekend to paint with you know, 73 different colors and you get some really exceptional results from that. If you then take that wall and you whitewash it as, you know, as a city thinking we're abating graffiti, um, what happens is you basically nuke it back to the Stone Age and the only people that are gonna be willing to paint there are people who are tagging, you know, and you'll then have to basically start the process all over again. Um, and eventually the tags will get covered up by throwies and eventually the throwies will get covered up by pieces and eventually uh, productions. And depending on the location, that process of kind of renewal can take, you know, months or, or years, or in this case, weeks. Um, so, um, um, but it's a lot like, uh, it's a lot like gardening. Um, you know, you, you know, you can, you can try to just like use weed killer on your entire, you know, uh, um, um, yard, um, but you're going to kill a lot of really good plants in the process. So maybe that's not how you want to approach it. Um, Eric yeah, knows a few things. Eric knows a few things about, about that aspect of it. I mean, you're, you're seeing it here, right? Like this is, this is where, you know, and all kinds of stuff and then they got white they got whitewashed and you see that the, the stuff that goes up is crap and then it gets covered up again and back again right so that that process of of seeing that play out over time and, and i guess that's what our what my practice is all about is about being able to use data like this to be able to tell stories um visually that um wouldn't be able to tell in any other way Yeah, it's a fast. I mean, just and I, lo I love that 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 this this this. It's what I most love about visualizations is that a story that Cassidy just told that's like very complex about the nature of the ecosystem and the dynamics. Like you can see it, and it's just and it's it's just it's a whole different whole different way of engaging with with data. Um, any other ones we should look at, Cass? Oh, yeah, um, this one good. Twenty fifth Street is good, right? This, we were looking at this earlier. So this is a. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is a really elaborate production um, that took place over a long time, and, and I'll just go back to the beginning. So that's what it was before. It was on 25th Street in San Francisco, near Cassidy and Mai's favorite taqueria. Um, and then it kind of slowly comes up over the course of a whole year. Well, well, it's 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 not that long. I think it was maybe a few few weeks. Actually, some of these photos were taken at different times the same day. Um, oh, okay. But, um, but uh, yeah, this was the first time actually that I was out, uh, you know, taking pictures and ran into a crew of guys who were actually in the middle of a, of a mural, you know, production. And, um, you know, that opened up a whole piece of this, um, you know, of, of, of my process, which is how do I engage with the artists themselves? Because I was an outsider to their world and, um, you know, didn't want to be disrespectful of their their process and their concerns. So, you know, the, um, you know, policy that I ended up with was I never, I never capture, I never take photos of a person in the process of painting um, because it's illegal and because people get in serious trouble for doing it. Um, I don't even want to have a photographic record of, uh, you know, of, of uh, you know, people in the process of painting. So I just wait for them to step out of the way and then, and then shoot. Um, and, uh, or sometimes I kind of creatively shoot around people and then stitch the photos together um, so that, uh, so that I can, you know, um, um, have the, have the work in progress without the people. 
So that's that. Sure. I don't know. As you're, as you're sharing, I kind of want to jump in because um, Kathleen, I know you have to leave at 1.30 and have some questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, Something that I think is really interesting, I think about a lot, is how you refer to this project as a living archive. And I wonder if you might sort of talk a little bit more about, like we don't often think about archives as having life, as living, as sort of changing over time, right? We think kind of about them as uh, a documentation that we can go back to and refer to. So I wonder if you and Eric, maybe you two might talk about that language of living archive and how it sort of changed the way you think about other documentation processes. Ooh. Um, I don't know, Eric, do you want to take this one or do you have thoughts about it? I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, okay, I'm just trying to think about where to start. I mean, the, the I want to show something else, if I may. Um, yeah, please. Uh, you all know about this nine eyes. I do not. So this is Jonathan Raffman hmm. and he combs through Google street view imagery and finds wacky stuff. Hmm. Um, and some of the stuff is pretty wacky. Um, some of it is sad. Oh. Um, yeah, there's one that, of a tiger that's kind of wild but sort of this is kind of the inverse of, of what of what yeah there's a bunch of ones of prostitutes that's that's seemed to be a theme um yeah dude on the side of the road i want to see if i can find that there's a tiger one that's amazing and there's a butterfly one also that's just exceptional um and so basically this is like this idea that there's a camera that's that's always on and what what happens if you just leave the camera running and, and what do you find and it's not even so much about surveillance as it is, <laughs> look at that, <laughs> look at that. There's, a, there's a, a car, a truck carrying a mirror and that's the Google Street View car like uh, uh, reflected in the windshield, right? So just stuff like that, like these kind of moments of just of sublime beauty that are often accidental, um, that are that I just love to, to, to look through. So when I think about archives, yeah, this, this is nuts. I mean, anyway, this, this goes on and on, um, but, uh, yeah, there's, if you look through it, there's one of a butterfly. I don't, I don't have it to hand, but it's just kind of extraordinary. Um, so when I think about archives, I mean, I think it's just kind of changed really dramatically in the last, in the last 20 years, I guess, right? because that just didn't exist before. There wasn't the sense that like the cameras were always on and that they could then be used for some kind of artistic purpose. Um, and so I think that's, anyway, that's the first thing I think of when I think of archives and, and how they work is just this idea that the volumes uh, and, and the chances for accidental beauty in those archives um, is even is even uh, more extreme. Yeah, and kind of piggybacking on that, I, you know, when when I started graffiti archaeology, the, the 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 medium was film, you know, and uh, you know, and film was costly, right? You had to pay for the film, you had to pay for the developing and the making the prints, and um, so I was stingy about how I about what I chose to to shoot, and when it changed to digital and the cost became effectively free. Um, my whole mentality about um, capturing um, um, and documenting changed and um, I became kind of an obsessive hoarder of, of, of data. Like I won't even delete blurry photos um, or obviously poorly exposed photos because um, there's a chance that they may contain some little sliver of information which ends up being useful later. Um, and, um, you know, I went through that like as an individual and then I feel like we have this entire tech industry, um, you know, which is going through that in a major way. And, um, and, and in, that, in that situation, we see that there's actually um, a downside to that, you know, collection of, of, uh, of information because when you, when you have enough of it, you can do things that, that um, you know, not just for artistic purposes, but for other purposes, not all of them good. And so, um, you know, there's been, a real push and pull in, in, in my heart about um, just what kinds of information I want to actually capture um, and what information I want to deliberately not capture, or if I do capture it, not reveal it. Um, and one of those is actually like the locations of um, these walls, because in a lot of cases, um, if everybody knew where the wall was, 
there would very quickly not be any graffiti there anymore at all because um, there would just be too much attention on it. Um, so there's this whole thing of like the kind of um, the concentric circles of, of, of secrecy within the culture and that kind of porous border between insider and outsider, um, you know, and so I just try to keep, uh, stay really respectful of that and not um, blow up any spots. But that also, you know, carries through into everything else that I do with technology that I don't want to ever do something that's going to violate somebody's privacy. Um, um, and, 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 you know, I feel like the, the, you know, the design world and the tech industry should be taking that very, very seriously now more than ever. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I wish I could stay for the rest of this because it's so interesting. And you guys, um, you know, you need to see the other stuff that Eric is doing now with the murals in San Francisco. So um, 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 I wish I could stay for that, but I'll, I'll, I'll watch it on the video uh, after, I guess. Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks for joining us, Cassidy. Thanks so much for having me with this, you guys. Take care. Um, is Shannon on the call? She said she was going to try to be. It does not look like it. Okay. Um, we can do it without her. Um, so I wanted to share some other work that I've been uh, helping to support in, um, in my community. Um, also related to murals. Um, and I think the, the thing to, to focus on for me is, you know, on, on the one hand, this, this kind of thing is happening in a very um, extra, uh, outside of any sort of permitting process or, or anything like that. Um, what we're starting to find um, with, in San Francisco in particular, is that, you know, the permitting process for doing anything in public has been particularly, it's, it's just hard to get anything done. It's, the system has kind of been designed to not allow things to happen very easily. Um, but I was lucky enough to meet up with um, a group called Paint the Void um, and have been helping them um, fund um, murals around town. Um, they have done something like 100 murals on vacant storefronts um, in San Francisco in the last, and Oakland in the last three months, which is something like a mural a day. Um, and so whereas beforehand, um, it was always incredibly difficult to get um, artists to get permitted to do murals because all those storefronts in town are boarded up, there's just this intense canvas that's just everywhere. So what Paint the Void has been doing has been painting murals on those vacant storefronts. And they've just been doing an amazing job. Um, this is one that they've painted on a building across the street from my house. Um, um, I helped them select the location. So this is, there's, there's basically a hundred of these now all over San Francisco and Oakland. Um, and I, I think the, the, the conversation to have is what, you know, not, not to be opportunistic or, um, or, or, or ghoulish about it, but, but as designers and as artists and as, as creative people, what are things that can happen now during the time of the pandemic that couldn't happen before? Um, and this is one of them. So I've been uh, working on another couple of murals um, in San Francisco. Um, I think the, the biggest one you'll probably see and maybe have read about is um, a Black Lives Matter mural that we painted um, on Fulton Street. You can see City Hall there in the background it was very much intended to be following in the footsteps of the ones that were done in different parts of the country. But what was exciting to me about this is that um, usually a project like this would have to go through massive community review. You'd have to have all kinds of you know, input from community stakeholders. Um, and this one happened in about a week um, from conception to finish. Um, and it was just this sort of moment where people were realizing like, hey, we need one of those. And um, there was a political moment where getting in the way of a Black Lives Matter mural um, on the steps of City Hall was maybe not the thing that we should be doing in this moment. So we came together in, a, in less than a week. Um, it was pretty amazing um, to see the way in which um, the moment had come for, for, this, for this street to be closed and for, for, that, for that to happen. So I, I've been putting my thinking cap on and, and thinking about what are other kinds of things that we could put um, around town. Um, and so one of them has been um, this, which is at the one of our busiest transit intersections at 16th and Mission, BART. Um, similar type of thing, like BART was dragging their heels for weeks and weeks and weeks and permits and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we were able to just come in to make something happen um, in a very short amount of time. So that's what I've kind of been looking for is opportunities that rather than kind of smashing my 
face against the bureaucracy rather than um, you know working with private partners. This is another mural that we put out on Hyde Street. Um, the opportunity came when we we gave them a small we gave the artists a small grant so that they wouldn't have to start the meetings with the landlords um, asking for money. So that got them a lot further in the conversation. Um, and when um, they when the artists asked, you know, can we paint a monarch mural on one side of your buildings? Um, the building owner said, well, how about on all three sides of the building? So they kind of upped the ante. And, and I think the opportunity there was they were getting ready to paint the, to repaint their building anyhow. Um, so the cost of having some artists do the work was just sort of a rounding error for them. And so what we started to do is to develop um, lists of buildings, like relationships with developers so that they tell us when they're getting ready to paint their buildings so that we can then come in with an artist and, and have some murals. Mm -hmm. So just, just trying to kind of think in design terms about, about how to beautify public space and how to, how to create a kind of public commons that works well, for, for better, that works better for the city than a kind of um, you know, ponderous um, city-led um, process because they've got so many restrictions that they really get. Right? So really just this kind of thing more. Um, and so that's kind of what I've been, that's what I would add about. I don't, uh, I would love to, to have it not just be a lecture, but be a conversation because there's a lot, there's a lot that's, um, we talked about a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Um, that was really great to see some of those images and to have you walk us through all of that. I guess one of the questions that I've been thinking about with these Black Lives Matter murals, um, you know, when I saw these images, I, my immediate thought too was of the one that went up um, in D.C., a few yep. weeks ago. And thinking about sort of, it made me connect this idea of sort of graffiti and street art to this idea of, right, thinking about how murals and graffiti can push social justice movements and thinking about its relationship to protesting and like being like the, the idea of a human microphone, right? When you're in a protest, someone sort of doing mic checks so that the whole crowd can sort of repeat the phrase that's being said so everyone can share information or ideas or movements. And it, this mural made me think of this sort of like large scale sort of human microphone um, that was operating differently, but visually. And so I'm wondering too, is as you're seeing these murals go up um, in the cities that you're living and working in, what other ways are you seeing them operate in? How are people responding? Is, are there changes that you are perceiving happening? because of the addition of them? Um, I, I think that people are waking up to the idea that we don't just have to sit back and take things as they are. I mean, that's, I think, the, the, most, the most important thing. I mean, there's, there's that expression, that's why we can't have nice things. And it, it turns out we actually can have nice things. <laughs> um, another thing that I think murals, a lot, of, a lot of reasons why murals don't get put up is because um, you know, they're very precious and they get put up by a certain kind of artist and then they get tagged and everybody says, oh no, that's why we can't have nice things. But what we've learned with this, with this mural in particular, we, we didn't just, we're not just painting it once, right? We're going to go back and paint it again every month and keep it fresh. Um, and I think that's one of the main things about doing work like this in the public realm is that you have to accept a certain amount of kind of tending of the work. There, you have to, there has to be maintenance. It has to be stewardship. It's it's much more like gardening than it is like architecture. Um, and we were talking earlier before the call started about how Stamen and and, uh, 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 and De Design for America both are like refugees for um, uh, places for for refugees from the architectural world. Mm -hmm. Like you can kind of learn from, from from that idea that like when you paint one of these, you don't just paint it once. You got to keep painting it. And there's a there's a kind of there's a commitment to continuing to keep it good that I think has been difficult for lots of places to get the uh, to, to, to kind of get the political will to make that happen but I think that's starting to change yeah yeah like, very, like, very, like very much started to interrupt but very much in particular like this mural is in a place where there's lots and lots of graffiti and lots of people trashing it and so what, the permit that we got with BART which they would never have agreed to before but, but agreed to now is we get to paint it and we get to paint it again and we get to paint it again like that's that's explicitly in the permit so anyway that's the kind of change that i'm seeing in the institutions that i'm working with yeah that's really interesting too and yeah i had a question sort of in the beginning about right this idea of you think of graffiti and even the way we were talking about the graffiti archive before right of this idea of ephemerality of iteration of change over time 
So it's interesting to hear yep. you thinking about this sort of change also in the way that you're operating and thinking about the sort of former function of murals being something that can be more lasting and can be something that you care for and about and that being also part of what it is, part of that community care, yeah. um, I think is really fascinating. Totally. I mean, this, this, this mural in particular, I mean, this, this, this is, is painted on a wall. It's across the street from, um, from uh, the building that I live in in San Francisco, and, and I, I keep an eye on it. Um, but again, you know, the, the arrangement was, the, the, what I'm trying to say is that the, the, uh, most of the time that people put murals on this, um, on this, on this garage door, it'll get tagged within a couple of days. Um, and so what we decided to do is to find a local street artist who was part of the community. And um, it's been great, like it hasn't been tagged at all. Like it's, it's not just about doing something, it's about the right people being seen to be empowered by the work. And I think that that's a crucial conversation that a lot of us are having right now. And I think there's also something really interesting about I had been thinking when you were sort of bringing up the topic of, right, the sort of increase of graffiti and murals, especially during quarantine and the pandemic, of thinking about how do these, how does graffiti, which I was thinking more of being ephemeral, sort of allow us to sort of give voice or process and, and sort of permanently or permanently put something on a wall in a time that is so tenuous and so everything is changing all of the time. And so I actually think it's really fascinating that in this real moment of uncertainty and ungroundedness and that you all are working to create these murals that are actually more permanent and are thinking about permanence in a different way um, as a sort of nice response to that, that continued uncertainty that we're feeling. And to do that is to be talking to and having the people do it who are really on the ground to represent and empower the community um, rather than just being someone that you bring in and is not doing that work. Yeah, I think, I think that's that's something that, that, that all of us are, are, are learning is super important is that, I don't know, it's so easy to say community, 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 right. but it, it just, just it, it, it very often can just mean only, only um, disenfranchised people. And so it, bec it becomes kind of toxic in this way of like community by definition means powerless. Um, and I think that that's got to change if we're going to make the kind of changes that, that I certainly want to see in the world. Sure. We also have a question that's a little bit more on the sort of like logistical operational side. Um, but the question is, how do you choose which buildings are painted on? Do you consider the role of that property owner and whether or not they have um, efforts and actions for Black Lives Matters movement and COVID support um, for affected individuals? Yeah, um, it's, it, it's, I don't want to speak for Paint the Void, but it's been, um, you know, they're moving very, very quickly. Um, like I said, they've been doing a mural a day since the pandemic started in March. So um, I know that that's very much important to them. And I know that the neighborhoods that they work in are often neighborhoods that are problem, uh, you know, can, can have problems. Um, you know, this, uh, this painting right now is, is, is a relative of, of, the, of the artist who's doing the work. I don't want to say his name yet, but uh, um, so there's a, there's a sense that um, if we go into this, like here's another one that I've been working on, I, I meant to show you. Um, is it? Sorry. All good. No, I love it. It's like, real, you're like muraling over your own screen, graffitiing over your own computer screen kind of right Yeah, totally. Um, sorry. I should have had this up and running, but you can cut this part out of the. Out of the yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So here's this is the other one that I'm working on. Um, this is um, so these murals that are down here. This is across the street from my office in San Francisco, um, and this is a abandoned derelict building um, that's locked in a pretty toxic conversation with um, between um, people that are. Uh, purporting to speak for the community and um, and the developer, um, so these this mural that you see, these murals that you see on the bottom, we did these in two days, um, and then this is proposed for what's going to be on the top of it, and so this idea that we would just cover the city with photographs and faces of people of 
color seems like the right thing to be doing in this moment. This is when you come up, this is one of the busiest transit centers in San Francisco. So when you come up, or at least it used to be. So when you come up, you'd see not just graffiti, but photographs of kids from the neighborhood. Um, so that's been, that's, that's been the, the way that we've been thinking about that. This is a you know, historically um, Latinx neighborhood called the Mission. Yeah. Yeah, and um, just because we're, we're at 1.43, I sort of want to end on a question of, um, yeah, I really appreciate the sort of um, how you use a language of like also beauty and joy in all of this and the importance of that. And I wonder if you might just share sort of a few ending thoughts about what you hope to sort of see as with murals and graffiti and what they can do for us sort of moving forward um, in the future. There's an amazing article about beauty and evolution that I encourage you all to read. And there's something about beauty that we kind of think of even as designers, we think of as extra or something that comes later um, or something that you attend to beauty after you um, get the basics started. And I think that's a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about the world. I think that beauty uh, as, as this article is showing is um, something that is kind of baked into biology um, mm -hmm. and that if we leave beauty to the end, we're leaving some of the most important stuff to, um, we're not, we're not, we're not going to be able to, to unlock the, the potential um, that the work has. I think it needs to be beautiful from the start. Amazing. Thank you so much, Eric, uh, for this time that you've given us. It's been a really fantastic conversation. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as a follow-up, this video will be recorded, posted on the DFA blog um, and YouTube. And then join us next week. Um, next week we have Dee Nichols, uh, who is in St. Louis, in St. Louis uh, coming with Kelly Wisniewski, who is uh, DFA, wore all the DFA hats. But Dee's gonna be really talking about their practice in uh, their social practice, intersecting with design, intersecting with the civic sector. Um, and they're asking everyone to come uh, with a meal so we can sort of really just eat together and talk about this sort of moment that we are in. So it should be really great. Um, thank you, Eric, again. It's been a pleasure to have you. Um, Amazing. Thanks all for being on the call, uh, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Nice chatting with you.